You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And you have tuned in to The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane. We're here every week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. It is different up here. High altitude gardening. It's different from the coast where you're right. You know, there's a lot more atmosphere. It's, it's brighter. Uh, the wind this week hit us. So, so flatlanders, we call those folks that come up from Phoenix or Tucson. Uh, they don't know what wind truly is. Yes, you get some dust storms. That's not wind. That's dirt. Uh, we, we actually have things that will blow over. If we get the wrong, if you if you water incorrectly, uh, you have a shallow rooted plant, it will blow over. If you, if you have gophers or grubs, they can eat the roots and they can't hold these things up. The the plants will start leaning to the northeast, and so they'll start falling over when they load up with fruit. And so there's a different. It's different in the mountains of Arizona, and that's what we go over every week here on the Mountain Gardener. How do you garden timely, work with the environment, seasonally uh, uh, plant your your gardens or take care of your landscape? This week, uh, I read an article in uh, Garden Center Magazine. So this is a, a trade pub- uh, publication. Uh, it's national. It's, it's read by all of the uh, plant gurus that have larger facilities in the in the country, and they came out with another study. This is the same every year. This is the first one I've seen since the economy has come back. Before that, we had mid-2000s. We had some, some studies, but it's going, what is your landscape worth? How does your landscape affect the value of your house? Uh, and what they found was, and I'll just quote some of these things. I won't read the whole article. It'd be boring, but it's Garden Center Magazine, March issue. Um, it says, basically, your landscape gives you more return on your investment. It's the only thing you can do to actually gain value. If you put a new kitchen into your house, you're going to return or get a return on your investment. You put $100 in, you'll get $92 out. So you don't get $100. It's not doesn't add value. It adds enjoyment, but it actually costs you some. So $92 to $93 uh, cents out of out of every dollar you spend on a kitchen remodel, you'll get back. Bathrooms, they're 73 cents. So you're dropping by 25% value. Again, it's for pleasures for you to just enjoy that new hot tub or shower or whatever, but it's not to increase the value of your house. Landscapes increase the value of your home by 11 to 20%. And so that's new. I've never seen 20 before. And they're using realtor.com. They're quoting landscape uh, uh, organizations. Uh, where they're tracking the numbers. Here's the same house in the same neighborhood. Here's one with, here's one without. What happened? And so they're, they're, they're sharing the numbers from this. Said 84% of people in the U.S. agree that a quality, the quality of a home's landscape would affect their decision to buy a home. According to the article, uh, landscaping it can account for up to clo- uh, close to a third of a home's value or 28%. That's realtor.com. Uh, Plus, data shows beautiful yards make people happy. According to a study by the National Association of Realtors, after completing a landscape project, 75% of respondents said they have a greater desire to be at home. That's a good thing. 65% have an increased sense of enjoyment when they're at home, and 79% feel a a major sense of accomplishment. Well, that seems to make sense because I feel the same thing when I complete a good uh, quality planned out garden or landscape or section or patio or deck. Uh, landscape is a, an asset that must be maintained, though. They're saying there is an expense to it, that it adds value up to a certain point, And then once it overgrows, that space becomes jungle-like. Now it starts to depreciate the value of your house. They're saying that uh, that your landscape should be maintained like painting your house. The inside, let's say a kitchen or changing fixtures out. Uh, just general cleanup, taking care of trim, anything that's of value you need to maintain to keep that value up. They're saying your landscape is is no exception. Let me turn the page here. So now they're saying that uh, landscapes in windy sites, this would be the mountains, this is us, uh, a windbreak or shelter planting can reduce the wind 
by up to 50%. And if you reduce that wind in the, in the winter, it can reduce your heating bills by up to 20 to 40%. And just reduction in fuel cost uh, to, to keep your place warm. And it goes on and on and on. What else we got here? Anyway, that's I've written about this before. I should write an article on this. I'll see what I can do with that. See if I can put that in the writing schedule and actually share some of that sources and stuff. I thought, oh, interesting. Read that magazine today and went, oh. Uh, it, and the numbers didn't change. They were the same 10, 20 years ago. About every seven or eight years, we see those same numbers come out. It's always the big players in real estate as the realtors, the big landscape companies. Uh, just telling you what they what they see, what they see the values go up. So your landscape is an asset to you. Take care of it. Enjoy it. Lisa and I, we look at it and go, we just love being outdoors. We love entertaining. Uh, we love the therapy. Uh, just uh, being out there with the fresh air, the physical exercise, the going up and down the stairs uh, just adds health and vitality. There's a spiritual element to it. You just feel more connected when hummingbirds are flying around. Butterflies are out this week. So we're seeing more and more butterflies. They're in the migratory pattern now. So that's a, a value. And then you just want to keep the HOA off your back. Some of you. Some of you don't care. You don't live in those areas. But it just uh, makes it more firewise. There's a lot of benefits to being outside and, and enjoying a sunset. Sipping coffee and watching a sunrise. Uh, just have sit laying out in the sun with your dogs. That's pleasurable. And so we, we do enjoy that a lot, much less the hot tubs and grills and patios and all the other stuff that's there in the landscape or art. So that's, that's some highlights. This week we did have some wind. Watch those juniper trees. When there is a lot of wind out going across the mountains, it's not the junipers in your yard that's causing the grief. It's the forest that's out there where the, where the windy, when this wind kicks up, just pollen goes everywhere. So you really want to be careful. And I would say shut the windows when it's a win I know this is hard. You've been waiting all winter to, to open up the windows. But when it's windy, all that, all that pollen comes inside. And then we wonder why we have allergies. We're blaming the maple tree or the aspen or the fruit trees that are out there. It's not those at all. It's not even those tiny little ground-covered junipers. It's the wind coming off the forest that picks up that 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 uh, pollen, just shoots it everywhere. And so I make sure at, at night we sleep with the windows open uh, whenever possible. But during the day, we close it up so that we don't have issues down the road. We live outdoors, and so I naturally have allergies from junipers or our main culprit. Uh, uh, sycamores bother me. Aspens, that white, uh, 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 it's, it's actually, uh, I don't know what it is, a powder almost on aspens. I'll break out from that. It bothers me. Uh, azaleas. If I get azalea sap on me, I break out like poison ivy. It's the weirdest thing, but it's because I've worked in this industry for so many decades that I've just grown. I've just, I just have some allergies to things. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware and I try to compensate for that. I do take wild honey, locally sourced, uh, that has not been pasteurized or, or, you know, dumbed down. It's actually a living, breathing honey. I take some of that every morning and it does help. Uh, bee, ho bee pollen I take uh, quite a few times during the week. It does help. The, the negative with that is it's not a pill. So it's not like a steroid. You can take a Kenalog Kel shot or, or allergy shot and it just the steroids... Do something to your body. I don't know if it's all good, but it makes the allergies go away. I did that for many years, and I said, i got to get off these steroids. That cannot be good for you long term. Started taking honey, and it took about nine months. It's, you're almost taking honey now for the season in the future. And so I run down to the, to the honey man. Your, your local town has it, its own honey source. Uh, and I've heard that if you can get honey that's sourced in your neighborhood. They're collecting flowers in your neighborhood that you're allergic to. That's the best thing because it's, it's got all the pollens. That's, they've made honey out of the pollens that you're allergic to in your own backyard. And that does seem to play out. Um, so I take a, 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 right now I'm taking a desert mix because I know the mesquites and stuff are going to be blooming in another month or two. I was taking the Prescott wildflower uh, honey, 
But now I've switched over going, okay, what's the summer mix? I'm always trying to think a season ahead. Whether that makes that much of a difference, I don't know. Main thing is close the windows so you don't have to suck in all that dust and pollen during a windstorm. Have a lot in store of this show for you. Be right back. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. You're in the area with your dream home on the inside, but surrounded by boring? A castle surrounded by rock is just so bland, but we can help. At Waters, we have a team of plant experts ready to dress up and decorate even the most boring of landscapes with something fresh, new, and evergreen. Plus, we deliver and plant for you. Design your plants with the experts to help you beautify your new abode. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Hi, Waters with this week's Plant of the Week and our Black Satin Blackberries. A thornless, milky smooth blackberry that loves the Arizona sun and produces the most deliciously sweet, deep blackberries. Soft pink flowers cover the nimble canes and then yield hordes of the most delicious, juicy blackberries a gardener could hope for. Ready to plant in just $19 and only found at Waters Garden Center. 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love to grow the sweetest berries love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. I have a special guest in the studio. Of course, she's a special guest every week. Lisa Waters Lane comes in, and she shares your garden questions. Just what what are other people asking out in the neighborhood, and you can pick up on that. So when aphids hit uh, your yard, they're hitting everyone's yard at the same time. Waves of aphids are showing up, and so we're seeing that quite a bit. And so it pays to listen in, and, and uh, then you'll know what to look for in your own yard. So welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. So what do we have this week? <laughs> it's funny you mentioned aphids. They're... Oh. Um, I've had a wave of customers uh, with aphids in their pine trees. Oh, sure. Um, you know, going, what's that shiny stuff all over? So you're right. It is kind of the same. You start seeing the same thing over and over again. So definitely, you know, come in and talk to us or just listen. You'll, you'll learn a lot. Na- a- aphids natively like ponderosa pine. So they like pine trees. Mm-hmm. And so they're just attracted to this part of the state where, where pines naturally grow. And so even if you don't have ponderosas near you, the wind picks them up like this last week yeah. and carries them miles <laughs> into other neighborhoods. And so they'll also eat Austrian pines, Oregon green pines, scotch pine. They just like pines. They like the mm-hmm. taste. And right. so look for that glossy, shiny needles. Looks like mm-hmm. if someone took a hose and wet it down. Only one thing will will do that, aphids. Right. Or if the ground underneath it, the rocks underneath it is shiny. Same yeah, thing. That's, looks that's, wet. Yeah, it looks wet. Go ahead and spray that. We've got an organic oil here, or we've got a multi-purpose insect spray that just obliterates aphids. Super easy to kill. Yeah. Uh, spray early in the morning, and then spray it from a couple sides. I was spraying some aphids uh, a couple weeks ago, and... and I would spray from one side and the aphids would physically move (laughs) to the other side of the branch going, I don't want to be wet. I feel this is not going to be good. So you hit them from the other side and they're, they're gone. Yeah. I want to get rid of those boogers. Definitely. Okay. Well, we'll move on to our questions. Uh, Brianna, who lives out in Chino Valley, would like to grow raspberries and blackberries. She wants to know how much space should she give each bush and then what does she need to add to the soil to make them happy? Sure. You, you treat uh, any of your brambles, raspberries, blackberries. I would say go so far as grapes, uh, currants, gooseberries. They're all the same. Uh, nice, rich soil. So you don't want to just chuck them in the ground and expect them to thrive and produce fruit like crazy. You want to add some organic uh, material to the soil. So you, typically you dig the hole, same depth as the bucket, whatever you're buying, three times the width. And then amend about 25 30% of that native soil uh, you're going to use about 25, 30% of mulch to your native soil and blend that all together and backfill around it. They are heavy feeders, so they grow fast. I mean, a blackberry can grow 
I don't know, 10 feet, 10 foot canes coming out. It takes a tremendous amount of energy and food to do that. And so if you sprinkle some all-purpose plant food, it's a food that we put together here. The main ingredient is cottonseed meal that will help encourage uh, increased cane growth and increased fruit production. Same for grapes, same for any of these. I would say each bush, we've got them planted up and down our fence line. We've got them one every eight feet. And we've got something. We, we stagger grapes, raspberries, blackberries, just up and down the length of the property. I think you could pack them in a little bit tighter if you really wanted a hedge row. We didn't want that. We were using them as a landscape feature to soften a cedar fence. And we've got trellises leaning up against that. So I would say you can go as tight as four feet. Six feet would be natural. We've got it at eight feet, and it works, and we've got some space in between. I think that's a good spacing for most of your brambles and things. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, and we have a lot in, many different varieties. Oh, we did. I couldn't believe yeah. how many fruiting plants you got. <laughs> you had a 15-gallon uh, uh, blueberry come in that was magnificent. <laughs> Where did that come from? Usually we I only get five know. gallons, so I'm that's like, great. I don't remember ordering that. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, they throw fun things on the truck yeah. for me. Uh, Linda, who lives in Will Hoyt, has a very steep slope that's in a very hot, dry um, Spot wants to know what could she put on there, grow on there for ground cover for erosion control that would be the most minimal care. Yeah, Will Hoyts, they've got that western slope, so they get that last day sun up against. If you go up over the mountain from Prescott, head towards Kirkland, Will Hoyts looking down towards Kirkland, and so it can get hot down there. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is on a mountainside. And so some, some really tough things, they, they make some ground cover sumacs. They're native, so they call them low grow. <laughs> That's a great name. <laughs> Sumax, great for native. They'll naturalize. It is deciduous. It'll lose its leaves in the winter, but beautiful fall color, aggressive, uh, runs. One plant will turn into a six-foot round thing holding in the soil, deep root structure. I would think your creeping cotoneasters mm -hmm. would be a very good choice. Uh, and and some that maybe you, you didn't think about that aren't so much ground cover, I think you could use silverberries, even a, a Virginia creeper. That's a vining plant. It's native uh, of trumpet vine, a vining plant. One plant will cover, <coughs> excuse me, a 10 by 10 uh, space. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of choices. That's one next time you're in town. That's what they call out there. I'm going to town. <laughs> next time you come into town, come stop by. We'll, we'll walk you through several choices. You know, it's funny. Costco, Trader Joe's, uh, the VA hospital, uh -huh. just doctors in general, bring people to Prescott. And then while they're here, they're visiting. So we see people from Sedona and Camp Verde and Cottonwood and Wilhoyt and Kirkland, and oh, all over, w yeah. Williams, all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, come, come here and then they visit us while they're in town. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought Prescott yeah. would be in town? All right. Our next question is from Doug. He says, last year, my veggie garden really just did not do very well. Any recommendations for making this year better? Well, that's probably going to be soil. I've, I think sometimes the soil gets used up. So if it was a good production, then it just faded. That's usually a soil thing. We blame it on environmental issues, but I would front load. I would add some freshness to the soil, compost, manures, fresh potting soil. The water's potting soil that we, we produce, that is actually our grower's mix. If you could put that in the top layer of your raised bed or containers, uh, the plants, when you plant them, will just go, oh, look, more soil. And they just root out and keep going. So add some freshness. I would say add some nutrients. So the water's all-purpose plant food is a tremendous uh, a fertilizer feeding type type of plant for vegetables. So I'll usually sprinkle that on top of my soil. I'll add some gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. That'll reduce the blossom end rot and then add some fresh manures or soils of some sort. I'll blend that down to one shovel's depth. Then I'll start plugging plants. Uh, I, in addition, I also reserve some of my uh, of gypsum aside, as I'm planting things that naturally get blossom end rot, tomatoes, eggplants, squash, I'll sprinkle a little bit of, of gypsum underneath each hole, then I'll kick just a tiny bit of, of soil over top of that, so the roots of that plant have to go through that, so you get more calcium pickup. That'll reduce the amount of fruit rot that, that happens. So the, the, to, to recap, <laughs> add some soil, 
add some fertilizer, add some gypsum, blend to one shovel's depth, and then uh, start planting. I think you could plant heavily all your leafy things, eggplant, not eggplant, um, uh, spinach, lettuce, kales, all of that stuff, broccoli, cauliflower, Mm -hmm. potatoes, onions can all go in. Mm -hmm. Uh, The tomatoes and things, the things that form a fruit can go in here shortly. Well, um, I think some of the brighter areas, lower elevations, Cottonwood, Camp Verde, Sedona, and the brighter spots, Will Hoyt, we just mentioned, they're they're a little bit warmer. I think you could plant right now at the higher elevations, Prescott and above, maybe wait. We typically say Mother's <laughs> Day because that's the last yeah. frost. So. Um, when's the best time to get asparagus in? Well, you've got the roots. you got mm-hmm. roots and then you got plants. Roots would go in now. And then I think, do you have those out there in, in the... We do. In, we you've do. got asparagus starting into February, March, first part of April, and that'll run out because that's a very finite crop. Mm-hmm. And then uh, then you'll have some plants, although they're not as strong. Usually you do those by, by roots. Mm-hmm. Same with potatoes. I mean, you'll start those now by roots. A little tip on onions. They're best started by onion plants, not mm-hmm. onion sets. You'll get a much better, bigger onions uh, keeper when you do that. Well, Lisa, we are out of time. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our pink lady, Gara. One of the prettiest ladies you'll ever meet. Her flowers are the color of pink lipstick blotted on a white tissue. Gorgeous and carefree, her knee-high flowers sing in the slightest of mountain breeze and a hummingbird's dream diet, all for $12. She dresses up the mailbox and loves dryway heat and only found at Waters Garden Center. 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love ladies in pink, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Now, the weather has been stunning. I mean, it's just good planting weather. We want to be out there as gardeners, but then so do your plants. And so the garden centers you're seeing, at least in the up to about 6,000 foot level, I think Payson, uh, Prescott, uh, uh, your Kingman's, uh, uh, Cottonwoods, Camp Verde, Sedona, these garden centers, they're in their full swing. The the mountain areas, the White Mountains, Flagstaff, you might be, I'm sure you're seeing strong sales, but it's not the peak yet. You're probably in a couple more weeks, you'll be in full swing. And so we did see a windstorm this week and possibility of some light frost uh, around. I don't think you'll see heavy freezes at this point. So I think you could plant. And if you see a light frost, you could throw a sheet over it. it keep the frost off and be no worries at all. Even on your tomatoes. I'm holding off on my tomatoes yet. Um, and my basil, I have planted kales, arugula, uh, uh, rhubarb. I've got a lot of different that spring mix and they are actively, actively growing. Lettuce, you can't pick it fast enough right now. I'll probably this coming week plant some peppers. I, Lisa and I, we, we like our salsa gardens. And so we'll we'll go down that path. That's uh, tomatoes, cilantro, onions, uh, peppers. We love all, grilling peppers. I just love peppers. Uh, I like pepper jelly. I like peppers and pico de gallo. I like, I like peppers. Uh, hot ones, I like. Here's an idea for peppers. If you're thinking about planting a new pepper, this very high scoville or extremely hot peppers. I had a customer share this with me a couple of years ago. He grows habaneros or whatever crazy hot thing. They're so hot you can't taste them. But what he does, he, he um, grew the peppers, picked them, and then cr- dried them, crushed them up, and then he made basically, instead of red pepper uh, flakes. He's got his own hot pepper flakes out of the garden that he that he spices up pastas and pizzas and things in the grill. That's a great way to to harvest, grow hot peppers, and use them to add some zing to that uh, whatever that food source is. Uh, so that that's one idea. I my favorite 
or Anaheim's because I just love stuffing and grilling uh, peppers. And then jalapenos, just because that is the most flavorful, hot, zesty uh, type of pepper for salsas. And so that's our main thing. We have a we have a party in the summer. There is going to be fresh picked tomatoes and peppers and, and onions and cilantro. And there will be pico de gallo and chips abound. And the margarita machine might be powered up as well. We're never quite sure. Depends on the friends coming over. Uh, so anyway, that that's our that's what we like to garden with. And then lots and lots of flowers. And so the greenhouse is filled here at the garden center with all of the flowering things, except for the mid-summer things. We've not brought in zinnias and some of the really things that just love heat. Um, I would say hold off on, what is that? Uh, uh, vincas, the annual vinca. It just loves heat. It wouldn't have liked this last couple of few days. And so what? Be, it's it's planting season. Just, just be aware the soil's not quite warm yet. And those things that love the heat of summer, they're not happy being outside at night in your gardens. If you're not happy, they're not happy being out there without a parka on or something. But I think you could easily, easily plant as many geraniums and petunias and calipricoas and marigolds. And you could plant all the peppers and tomatoes and th- as you want. They're okay because they'll take a light frost and you can easily cover them if we do see some frosty nights coming up. It's, we didn't, we're not seeing that but it can turn on a flash here in the mountains. So just be ready. You should have that frost cover ready just, just in case. A box, anything will keep that frost off. Uh, we are seeing an increase. It's, a, it's amazing. Now, we saw a weakness in the marketplace that we could, you know, this is Waters Garden Center in this Central Highlands area, edibles. Uh, the, not, not, not vegetables so much. That's kind of the the victory garden has has not died but it hasn't it's not growing it's kind of the same it's just maintaining the fruit trees is on the grow i mean it is growing i can't keep things in stock fast enough there's this tremendous interest in fruit trees and grapes and blackberries and brambles even currants gooseberries the old fashioned edibles are coming back a uh, blueberries just had i don't know another 100 blueberries coming big bear, big bushes with when well, you can see the fruit forming on them, it's very exciting. That department is active. It's growing now. Now it takes a lot of real estate. It takes a lot of room to show off. You know, you know, five hundred trees, peaches, apricots, nectarines, cherries, apples. So I think we've a, a garden center has more space dedicated to that kind of thing. So I don't think the boxes and the marts can can keep up with that. Nor do they have the interest or expertise. Maybe that's the reason why, and that's why we built that up, um, trying to get uh, expand the vining section. And I include in vines the, the trumpet vines, honeysuckles, e- even pyracantha, and expanding to raspberries, blackberries, grapes. It takes a lot of room to show those things off. It's, it's hard and a lot of expertise to, to talk about them. So that department, I think, this year will grow. We've seen the numbers preliminarily growing, but I, I think it's actually going to be pronounced as like, wow, if you want vines, woo, go to waters. They've got that. Uh, so that that's some unique things going on this year that we didn't see last year, the years past. Be right back with more valuable garden tips and tricks with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Waters, with this week's Plant of the Week and our Black Satin Blackberries. A thornless, milky smooth blackberry that loves the Arizona sun and produces the most deliciously sweet, deep blackberries. Soft pink flowers cover the nimble canes and then yield hordes of the most delicious, juicy blackberries a gardener could hope for. Ready to plant in just $19 and only found at... Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love to grow the sweetest berries love to shop. And we have Lisa Waters Lane back in the studio with her garden insights. And so she shares her design tips, her flair, her garden-esque 
uh, what, what she's doing in the gardens or seeing or talking about out in the garden. So I think that's valuable to capture that so you don't just hear me talking to you over the airwaves. <laughs> Welcome back, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> so can I just air one grape while we're oh. before we get started? Uh, yeah. I call it the knucklehead factor. <laughs> You know, Facebook's been in the in the press, and mm-hmm. this is why they've been in the press because knuckleheads actually have Facebook accounts. So I, I posted a new sign, uh, uh-huh. graphics. We're creating graphics for the new truck oh, that we yeah. put into service, a planting mm-hmm. delivery truck, and we have a lot of followers. It's like a nine, ten, I don't know, twelve thousand followers on our Facebook page. And this one follower, I just said, hey, what do you think? Getting opinions right. from folks. You get some insight. And they said, put put Vincent on there. <laughs> There's too many butterflies. It looks spring-esque. A lot of good comments. Sure. One knucklehead came in and said, I'll never shop at your place again. Your wife is stupid. And you just have terrible customer service. And I went, why don't you? What, are you off your meds today? What is going on with you people? If you can't make a positive comment yeah. Stay off of Facebook. I mean, what is that? I mean, there's probably three dozen comments and one had to say that. Oh, Come on, bad. folks. Be civil. Be nice. Yeah. It's us. You're offending us directly, not some blank, huge company in Arkansas. Come on, people. So anyway, I deleted her post. And then I blocked her, and so she'll never make another comment again. Well, I was trying you... to figure out why would she even... Why Why yeah. are you following our page? <laughs> what is that? It's ridiculous. Must have just had a bad day. I don't know. Just uh, yeah. come on, folks. Be nice. That's too bad. Follow up. We do nothing but uplifting stuff on there. It's, it's garden quotes, and it's mm-hmm. pretty pictures. It it's meant yeah. to be uplifting our page. And then you get... Knuckleheads. You get that every once in a while in the garden you know what she needs, dear. Medicine? No, she needs to garden more. (laughs) Very good. At Walmart. (laughs) I don't know. We probably didn't return her petunias that she killed uh, years and years ago. I I have no idea. She wouldn't elaborate, nor did I care. Anyway, I feel better. Good. I'm glad you feel better. Now I'm upset. (laughs) Oh, I but think that's we, retail. You we can't get behind always this. make everybody happy, but right. by golly, we really, really try here. We do, indeed. Yeah. Dozens and dozens. She probably gave us a, a one-star review. We've got like hundreds of <laughs> reviews. It's like 4.89 stars. Mm-hmm. But there's that one person that you just go, what, yeah. what's wrong today? So it, that's why it's an average. Most people right. that come in and shop love us. And and, you know, the, the thing about Facebook and, and all of that, it gives people um, a way to say things they wouldn't say to your face uh, or to be uh. rude the way they wouldn't to your face. But it also, um, I think, sometimes inhibits communication huh. because if she truly has a problem, she should come talk to us and, and we'll see what we can do. I agree. And maybe it I was agree. her fault, but how yeah. do we make it better if, if you don't tell us? It's true. But you can, you know, blah, blah, blah on Facebook and you feel better, but. I, I don't know. think you're ugly, dear. I think you're beautiful. Well, thanks. And I think you're smart and I think your team is too. And <laughs> there, and I know that's the case. So I know she was wrong. So yeah. she's been blocked and, and uh, deleted. Okay. <laughs> What do we have? We should something uplifting. Yes, we will move on. So this week, I, it's funny. I've gotten a call just about every day going, now what are those trees that are blooming? Yeah, you know, that the too. white ones, the pink ones, the ones that are almost red. And um, yes, they are gorgeous. There's, you know, the Bradford pears, the white one, the uh, dark pink is variety of red bud. And you definitely see them and they're gorgeous. Uh, but not everybody has room in their yard for a great big tree. True. Um, yeah. But it's still so lovely to have those spring blooming uh, flowers and shrubs in your yard. So I thought I would talk about shrubs that are spring blooming. Oh, great. Because we can all fit shrubs in anyway. That's right. right. Yeah, just a border or, or out in a raised bed out by the mailbox. They fit almost anywhere. And there's mm-hmm. real cute ones knee high. There's to big some that are as big as you and I. Right. What's on the list? Well, I have many things on my list. <laughs> one of the ones, talking about short, cute little ones, but it does it probably gets about four foot, is the bloomerang lilac. Um, that has really, when was that introduced? Three, Three years, years ago, ago, I think, the, the a violet one. And then mm-hmm. they've introduced the pink one this year. So right. they're trying to get more colors. So it's 
definitely gaining in popularity, I think, because of its size. Now, most lilacs can get, what, six, eight feet? Yeah, uh-huh. head higher, a little bit taller, mm-hmm. yeah. So the, the blue meringue kind of tops out around four, so it does easily fit into yards, perennial beds, and that type of thing. And you're right, there's the purple and the pink, um, and it's a repeat bloomer in a, in a lilac, which is... Very unusual. Yeah, super. Bloomed three times last year for us. Mm -hmm. So it blooms kind of like a rose. Blooms very heavy, takes a rest. Blooms again very heavy, takes a rest. And it blooms in the fall again. So Mm -hmm. it's no other lilac does that. It's cute. It is cute. Very attractive. Nice, nice, neat little foliage on it, too. The flowering quince. um, You don't see those as much as you used to. There was the old traditional quince, which had like thorn. Don't those have thorns? They do, and fruits. And the you fruits. make jellies and stuff and, out of them, yeah. But they, I guess, hybridized or worked with them so that they don't get as big. Most of them are around four feet or so, um, and they don't have those great big thorns on them. Yeah, they, they don't fruit anymore either. gorgeous. And the colors are brighter. That you, oh, The regular are. quince was red flower. Now they've got pinks and and a peach uh, color. Peach color. Line. It's just having fun, and it's a double flower instead of a mm-hmm. single flower. So it's a really pretty shrub, and quince are tough. I mean, oh, they're yeah. native tough. They're they're really easy to grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely can take the heat, and keep on going. Forsythia, which is probably most people are very familiar with forsythia. It's that bright yellow, just a big shot of yellow out in the yard when everything else is still twigs. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of announces spring. It does. And don't assume everyone knows it. There's a lot of flatlanders from the deserts, you know, Southern true. California. It doesn't grow down there. Mm-hmm. It's unique to a four season climate. So mm-hmm. forsythia, every yard should have one because animals don't eat it. It announces spring, great fall color, easy to grow. Yeah. It's a good plant for here. Definitely. Uh, then I also threw in there the Western red bud. Oh, good. Um, yeah. Which is. Um, I guess technically a tree, but very short growing. What, eight feet, 12 feet? Something just like above that. head high, but it's usually mm-hmm. multi stemmed red bud right. instead of a traditional tree. Mm-hmm. So it is really a, it grows in the wild throughout the Rockies mm-hmm. as, a, as a big bush, basically. Right. And they've they've come up with that weeping, which I can't think of the name off the top of my head. That weeping red bud. I think that's, that's the name, isn't it? Weeping is it red just bud? weeping? I thought it I had so. another name with it. Yeah. But beautiful. It gets about four or five feet. And yeah. the branch, branches kind of bend over, kind of umbrella-like in it. They flow through rocks, over beds. Mm-hmm. It's very unique, very unusual. Yeah, definitely. Service berry. Now, that's another one. There's tree forms of service berry. Um, but there's some great shrubby, multi-trunked forms of service berry. White flowers on it. Very pretty. Native, draw hardy. Mm-hmm. White flowers in spring forms a tiny little berry that the birds love. And then the fall color is when they're really mm-hmm. famous. Bright, bright, intense oranges and reds. That's what you get from service berry. So a native, again, grows wild mm-hmm. and then uh, has white flowers, but it just adapts really well. If you're into birding, oh, it's yeah, a great it's one. A I think yours have, they've been out there. They've been in bloom for oh. a month or so. At so least, yeah. Nice long, long bloom, cycle. bloom time on them, definitely. And then for those shady areas... Uh, Daphne. Good choice. Absolutely yeah. gorgeous and smells amazing. Love the smell of Daphne. Your rhododendrons and your azaleas. People don't think we can grow those here. I keep I having that every once in a while. Really? They grow here? I'm going, yeah, they got a thick leathery leaf, waxy. Mm-hmm. They don't perspire very much as long as they're in the shade. Right. Mm-hmm. They're fine. Yeah, so definitely. Can, and beautiful, very striking color. Bright pink, bright orange. Uh, reds, they're they're wonderful, especially in those dark shaded areas. Almost a fluorescent color. I mean, those mm-hmm. those colors of, of the rhodes and the azaleas. Very oh, yeah. much striking. Nothing is as bright as those. Mm-hmm. And the pyrus, um, with which there's many different varieties of the pyrus, or lily of the valley shrub is its other name, usually has uh, real pretty white blossoms on it that is just gorgeous out in the yard. Great choices, Lisa. So shrubs, you can plant that bloom in the spring, kind of announce spring. You can have those, and most of them are in bloom here at the Garden Center now, ready to be planted. Be right back with more on The Mountain Gardeners. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden experts and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. 
New to the area with your dream home on the inside, but surrounded by boring? A castle surrounded by rock is just so bland, but we can help. At Waters, we have a team of plant experts ready to dress up and decorate even the most boring of landscapes with something fresh, new, and evergreen. Plus, we deliver and plant for you. Designer plants with the experts to help you beautify your new abode. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Ouch! Aw, man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. You got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. We should touch on irrigation. How do you water plants? Uh, That was last week's garden class, and and, and we went an entire hour, uh, hour and a half actually, with questions, lots of of energetic, really good questions on irrigation. I'm not going to go that deep here, but I think we should touch on that. We, We are turning our irrigation on. And so if you turned your irrigation off last November and you haven't watered since, I mean, there were some dry spots last winter. Uh, there was some, it was warm. So plants were using moisture more than they normally do. And so you might see some damage. We say that you should water your plants through winter about twice a month. That keeps them hydrated just enough to keep them from being damaged. If that purple leaf plum, uh, that pink flowering tree that now has purple leaves, or the white flowering tree, the Bradford pears that are now starting to put these green leaves on. Now it's red buds. That's the one that's currently blooming pink. I mean, you folks in Prescott Valley have the prettiest red buds. Oh my goodness. Good job for planting so many of them. Uh, crab apples are blooming downtown Prescott. And so if you, if you see a tree that's blooming only on the bottom, not the top, if you see a shrub, that is leafing out on the bottom, but not the top. It, like the top looks brown and dead. That's winter kill or winter damage. That plant got dry and then didn't have enough moisture to keep it going, to keep it, uh, um, keep the antifreeze that's naturally occurring within the structure of that plant uh, able to flow up and down the entire length of uh, those branches. And so it gave up the top portion of those flower buds or a leaf bud and said, I'm just going to keep the core alive. I'm just going to keep down towards the, uh, the roots alive. I'm just going to keep towards the ground alive. So that's damage. If you just water it a couple times a month, you would not, you would had no damage, beautiful tree. Uh, sometimes it can kill the plant, especially on things like uh, hydrangeas. Uh, I'd say, uh, 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 what's the uh, autumn sage or, or salvia gregii. Uh, some of these can be truly damaged hard to the point of death. If, if, they're, if they go dry all winter long, we do water. We turn the irrigation back on April 1, and generally we turn it off. We, we scale back a November 1. So those are kind of our, our markers, okay? So when you see foliage coming out, things are in bloom. You just see, oh, it's spring. That's your cue. Turn the irrigation on. Uh, when you see the last of the leaves drop, in the fall of the year, that's an indication time to turn the irrigation off or don't don't water as much. Right now, you're watering your established plants, things that have been rooting for a couple of years. You're watering those things one time per week. These are trees, shrubs, vines, roses, things that have a larger root structure. Once a week watering should be more than enough with mountain soils. Our soils are rather heavy, lots of clay, and so they don't... It's hard to get them to, to push water into the soil, and then they don't give it up very easily. So it's you're more prone to overwatering in a mountain soil at high altitude than you are, let's say, a desert or coastal type of soils that have that drain a little bit better. And so you, there you want to leave that system on for quite a long time so you can push that water deep into that soil, that clay soil. You want to go below, you want to go through the root zone plus a little bit more. That's the secret to a deep-rooted, hardy, uh, no matter what the drought fo- that follows, it's going to survive because you've, you've encouraged the roots. You've trained those roots to grow very deep. If you're, if you're watering every day for, let's say, 10, 20 minutes, 
that's basically spitting on the on the soil on the surface of the soil. It's that plant will actually kill off, will die. The bottom of the roots will die, and all that will live will be those surface roots. And that's where you get a fruit tree that will load up with fruit and fall over out of the ground because it was just watered that way frequently, very, very lightly. And so it doesn't have a deep root structure. A butterfly bush will blow over in the summer winds. Uh, certain things will just be damaged because they were very light rooted. You'll have uh, plants that the roots come up out of the ground. And so they're just hovering right there above the ground because it's so desperate for water. It's looking for any surface water it can find because we've never trained it to go deeper, uh, trained those roots to go deep. So that's a secret. Deep watering, water, that drip system, that thing should run an hour, two, three hours long. That emitter, that little tiny emitter head on the end of that spaghetti tubing, that's typically a one gallon per hour emitter head. You need to leave that system on for an entire hour to have one gallon of water drip out of that emitter head. Well, if you've got a 15 gallon tree that needs 15 gallons of water a week, you, you need to run that system. You need multiple heads to run for hours to get enough water to make that plant happy. If you're watering 20 minutes you know, every day, that's, that's like nothing. I mean, it will evaporate off about the time you turn the system off. So if you're watering 20 minutes, that's, that's literally no water. That's like thirsty in the deserts, and we're giving, you, we're, we're giving you water by dipping our finger into a cup of water and then putting it on your tongue. It's that kind of water source. You need, to, you need a cup full of water. You need to be drenched in it, and then you want to dry out. Some of you from the Northwest, you don't want to hear this. You folks from Portland and Seattle where you just have rain all the time, you're going, yeah, well, it rains every day. We're at continually rains from fall through spring. Yeah, my plants are going to need this too. I'm going, no, they don't. Hey, you're, not, you're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. You, you, this is different. The soils don't, don't perk. They don't drain very well. And so if, you, if you're watering frequently, deep, a lot of water, you can kill plants. Literally, you're more prone to killing plants in the mountains from overwatering than from underwatering. And so be, be careful of that. Uh, just, just be aware. Watch that. Uh, watch your containers. There's a lot of pottery. I mean, we're selling record amounts. I think we're up by like 15 or 18% or something in our pottery sales. These are big containers. They're pretty. They're easy to garden in. I think that's part of it. And people have feel good about they're, they could spend more money on on pretty things in the yard. I think that's part of it, but it's it's different when you're when you're container gardening. There, when you're watering big pots, you want to water things. You want to water that plant until you see the plant moist and you see water running out the bottom of the pot, and then you let it dry out. So that goes for hanging baskets, uh, bowls. Uh, for, for can big resort size pots, you're watering until you see some water drip out the bottom. That means you've watered the entire surface. Many of these are organic soils. So our potting soil is 100% organic. So there's no wetting agent. That's the part that turns a, 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 a potting soil from organic to non-organic. They're adding chemicals to help the peat moss Get, hydrate more consistently. Well, an organic fertilizer, uh, not fertilizer, organic um, potting soil doesn't do that. And so there, you you are are you have to actually physically wet down that potting soil and compost and stuff. And once it moistens, it stays that way. That's the beauty of it. Well, it's going to take up a, a, a lot of water. You got to water that entire plant, and then and then the the soil underneath that plant to really hydrate or have that sponge-like effect of all that potting soil in that container. This is important. For, for hanging baskets, if you allow that to dry out, the soil will actually shrink. And now the water, when you water it, it doesn't go in the soil. It goes around the soil, around the edge of the pot, and then out the bottom. So it looks like you've moistened that hanging basket enough, but really it dried out so much that the soil can't even receive it. So like it's crunchy like charcoal <laughs> square. So there, sometimes I'll take my hanging basket if I've let it go too long, and I'll just let it soak in a saucer of water or something that where that, that moisture can come up from the bottom and through the top and just rehydrate so the soil swells back up and then plugs the 
the ring, the, the edges of the pot. And so now you can water it easier. Just, just be aware. That's how you want to water things. So many times newbies to container gardening, they don't water nearly enough. They're almost spitting on it. And then they walk away and they wonder why their plants die in three, four, five weeks. That's why we never encourage deeper roots on those. Okay. One more break. We'll be right back on The Mountain Gardener. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the mountain gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our pink lady, Gara. One of the prettiest ladies you'll ever meet. Her flowers are the color of pink lipstick blotted on a white tissue. Gorgeous and carefree, her knee-high flowers sing in the slightest of mountain breeze and a hummingbird's dream diet, all for $12. She dresses up the mailbox and loves dryway heat and only found at Waters Garden Center. 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love ladies in pink, they love to shop. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our single blue pinion pine. This new blue variety lends to a tidy appearance in a bold, tough tree. Highly desirable for its edible pine nuts, so eat up. Let it grow wild, or this 10-foot tree can be shaped for the holidays. These perfectly formed trees are just $85 and only found at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love native pines and pine nuts, they love to shop. Before we leave that irrigation idea behind, you should turn your system on and then I would run, I would double cycle it, run it one full cycle like you normally do in the peak of June, do it a second time and that will rehydrate the the plant. So they're starting off strong, uh, the, the spring season, they need a lot of moisture as they're flowering and new leaves, but mainly what it does it now allows you to walk the yard and spot the wet spots where that irrigation is, where that drip emitter head is, where the tubing is. So many times you have leaf litter and things if we've thrown rock over top of them and the, the emitters are under the surface and you can't see them. If you run it a double cycle, you run it twice, all of a sudden you see the wet spot showing up going, oh, that's working. Yep, got it, got it. Sometimes uh, the pack rats got into a couple of mine and I had to put new emitter heads on them. I had one of my valves, the couplers, came off. And so this I was wondering why the end of the system didn't run, didn't have any water. No, none of the emitters were working. I followed the line back and went, oh, well, I, all I had to do was plug the two half inch, uh, plug the uh, coupler back together and away we went. But if you don't know that, so things happen when you have that system off in the winter, you need to go and tune up or maintain that drip system. It's important. Otherwise, you don't know when a head clogs up. I replaced three drip emitter heads, earwigs or snails or something that clogged them up or calcium. So I went, oh, not, not dripping fast enough. Clipped it off, put a new one on, fixed. I personally like two gallon per hour emitter heads, and I like them to be pressure compensating and self-cleaning. And so there's a little button emitter where water goes through, it spins, comes out the end, so it self-cleans. It's more true to its rating, so two gallon per hour, at the top of the hill as it is at the bottom of the hill. So we have hydraulics at, at you know pressure per square inch affecting that. And then secondly, two gallon per hour, I find, just doesn't clog up as easy. A one gallon or a half gallon per hour e- emitter head didn't take anything. One piece of grit will clog up that small orifice. And just, I find less maintenance with my two gallon per hour emitter head. So I use that pretty consistently for anything, tree, shrub, rose, any, any, anything that's a vine, anything bigger rooted. I use a two gallon per hour emitter head in my containers. I use an adjustable, uh, one to 10 gallon per hour emitter head on a stake. So it has a quarter inch tubing, Put it on there and you stick it in the middle of the pot, adjust it till it till that bell or that fan uh, uh, goes to the outer edge of that pot. And I go, oh, that's good. Perfect. And it works really well. So if you got issues on that, come see us. We can walk you through all that irrigation questions, help you maintain things. Uh, we do have a class coming up. Now, uh, these are big classes. Our native plant class is going to be next weekend. So April 21st. 
So at 9.30, it's going go native and low, low maintenance uh, uh, landscapes. We'll go over which plants are best, which ones are lowest maintenance. Uh, so if that's of interest, uh, w w you can spot them all out there. Also, we'll, we'll load up with a lot of natives getting ready for that class because that's a specialized class. And everyone should have some natives in their landscape. Uh, so this, we'll just show off the, the fanciest ones, the newest ones, the brightest colored, the longest blooming, the ones that hummingbirds love. We'll go into details. And then April 28th, it's grow your own groceries. That's about the week prior, two weeks prior to Mother's Day weekend. That's when all the gardens, all of them go in. We will front load the nursery with thousands of tomatoes. Oh my gosh. Peppers, eggplants, squash, zucchini, watermelons, pepper, beans. They'll, we'll, it'll all be there and then how to grow them how to get the most harvest out of those plants. I usually teach that one, maybe with Elisa, and, uh, and it's just how do you get sweeter tasting peppers, larger tomatoes? How do you get more harvest on your beans? We'll go over all of that. That's fertilization, watering, soils. Go into detail on all of that. It will be packed, standing room only. Of course, this weekend it's um, – Guarding for newcomers, I believe. Michelle and Doug are, are teaching that class. Should be fascinating. Zones. Uh, what's our, what are our frost dates? And all that detail you need to garden right here in the mountains of Arizona. Throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. Come say hi. And any advice uh, you need, come ask us. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Ouch! Aw, oh, man! Another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. You got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You need an area with your dream home on the inside, but surrounded by boring? A castle surrounded by rock is just so bland, but we can help. At Waters, we have a team of plant experts ready to dress up and decorate even the most boring of landscapes with something fresh, new, and evergreen. Plus, we deliver and plant for you. Design your plants with the experts to help you beautify your new abode. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.